Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the channel. I'm your host, Rebecca, and I recap live trials while I'm crafting. Uh, you'll see the crafting cam up in the corner. That's what I'm doing while I'm listening to the trial. Now I'm going to tell you what I heard on day 28 of the Chad Daybell case. He is on trial for the murder of 17-year-old Tylee Ryan, 7-year-old J.J. Vallow, and his wife, Tammy Daybell. Now, after she passed away, he marries Lori Vallow, who was the mother of those two children that he is on trial for murdering. She has already been convicted of those three murders and is serving life in prison without the possibility of parole. And she faces murder charges in Arizona for the murder of her former husband, Charles Vallow. Yeah, it's a mouthful. So what happened? We're, we are getting close to the end. Thank you, Jesus. Anyway, <laughs> we are down to the final witnesses for the defense case. The prosecution has rested their case. Now they have the burden of proof. They have rested their case. The defense is putting on their case, but the, don't forget, the prosecution gets to bring witnesses back in to rebut what we have heard from the defense, which is not much, to be honest with you. Not much of a defense at all. So the first person on the stand yesterday, Wednesday morning, was Patrick Eller. He is a cell phone analysis um, person. He's been trained in cell phone analysis. And he was hired by the defense to review all of the data that was reviewed by the FBI cast member. Now, if you'll recall, cast is sells for stands for cell phone analysis, something, something or other. But there's only about 70 people that work for the FBI that do this nationwide. And we got one of them on the stand earlier. So this expert wanted to review everything that he had reviewed. And here's what, here's how he broke it down. He said, and he did, he, he analyzed three different dates, September 9th, September 23rd, and October 18th. These are the three days associated with the deaths of Tylee, JJ, and Tammy. Now, um, what he was trying to do was identify the device IDs. He doesn't have phone numbers or anything like that. He has device IDs. How many device IDs were in the location near where those two bodies were found, JJ and Tylee, on September 9th and September 23rd? So on September 9th, he he narrowed it down to 250 meters. He wanted to see how many device IDs were within 250 meters of the fire pit, that location. And he found 19. None of them were Chad Daybell. One of them was Alex Cox. Now, we don't know if it was Melanie Gibb or David Warwick or anybody else because we don't know what their device IDs are, and neither does he. And he said it could have been somebody just driving by the property. So, no Chad, no Chad. So why, why not? Why no Chad? Because he, one of two reasons, he either had his geolocation service turned off or he had the phone turned off. This guy said the best way to stop the ID from telling your location is to turn it off. Chad's a smart guy. He probably turned his phone off. Then on September 23rd, he was able to locate 17 devices. This is the morning that we think J.J. Vallow was murdered and buried. He One of those 17 was Alex Cox. And none were Chad. So he wanted to, lo he wanted to narrow it down even further. So he changed the, uh, the data range from 250 meters to 30. 30 meters, and he found four devices. One was Alex. None were Chad. So again, Chad had his phone turned off. Then on October 18th, uh, no Chad again, but Alex's phone was 
outside the 250 meter range. It was about a mile and a half away. But we know that Alex Cox's phone pinged at the Salem church, which is about two, two and a half miles from Chad Daybell's house the night that Tammy was allegedly murdered. So on cross-examination, and this was this was brilliant, I gotta say, it was brilliant. The prosecution said, didn't you, were you aware that Chad Daybell sent a text message during that same time frame saying that he was on the property, that he had shot a raccoon and he was burning it and burying it? And he's like, no, I wasn't aware of that. So, but the problem with that is, you know, Chad could have sent that text from anywhere. But he's telling his wife, I'm on the property. Anyway. I thought that was really interesting. So then the next person was a DNA analyst and smart, smart guy, really smart guy. So he was asked, there were four hairs found on the duct tape that was on JJ Vallow's body. And he was asked to look at those hairs and rule out Lori Vallow Daybell, Chad Daybell, and JJ Vallow. And they were all ruled out. None of their DNA came back to those hairs. Here's a video of what he said. In this case, are they testing? Did Lori Vallow contribute uh, the hair? Did Chad Daybell contribute the hair? Did JJ contribute the hair? So they tested three hypotheses uh, and in each case got a negative, a valid, very uh, uh, sensitive and correct answer that none of those people contributed those hairs. So that's that's how negative is used in that in that setting. Is it used in other settings as well? Yeah, and like I said, it's a tricky term the way people use it. So I, I uh, would it be fair to say that in this particular case, there's an absence of Mr. Daybell's DNA on any of the items that you reviewed? Yes, there's an absence of his evidence. Okay. Of, his, of his sample, of his DNA. And before we finish up, I would just like to touch on the fact that were the results that you reviewed in this case, were, were, were they valid? Yeah, we check all their controls. And so they, you know, when any time the lab's running a bunch of tests, they have some blank tubes with just the chemicals to make sure nobody's skin cells from the lab or the police got in there or whatever. And so the controls that we, that we uh, use uh, in this case, were standard controls at all three labs, and they all were okay. They were fine controls. So they follow that's the proper, trustworthy. They follow the proper testing procedures. They follow the proper procedures, and they got good results with their controls. So after those two witnesses, there was a hearing, and it was a motion that the prosecution was making. They're, they're called motions in limine to bring in another witness to rebut some testimony that Emma Murray, D Emma Daybell Murray, Chad's daughter, had given. As you recall, Emma had said that her and her mother, because they work at the same school, they worked at the same school, they had gone to this benefits program and heard about the ability to increase their life insurance. And she said it was pretty cheap. So we decided we're going to increase our life insurance and they fill out the application and turned it in. Did you consult with your husband's? No, we did not consult with her. And she was adamant about that. No, we, are you sure? No, we didn't consult. Then it was pointed out that Chad Daybell's signature was on the application. He had signed it on a Sunday. But the prosecution wants to bring in a witness that that. He, they actually wanted to do it during their case in chief, but the judge had said, no, it's hearsay. You can't, we're not going to have that. But now that the door has been opened by the defense, by Emma Murray uh, saying, oh no, we, we didn't consult our husbands. This woman is going to say that Tammy told her that her husband wanted her to increase her life insurance before she retired. And the judge said, yeah, she can come in and say that. So that's going to be one of the rebuttal witnesses that we hear. Uh, I also expect that we're going to hear from Ray Hermosillo and a guy named Cannon, except that I already know Cannon's not going to be able to testify. And I'll tell you why in a few minutes. So 
Hermosillo, I don't know if you recall, he he was the officer that was tasked with re listening to all those jailhouse phone calls. And remember I said Emma and her father would talk every single day or they would meet in person and that we were probably going to hear some jailhouse phone calls to rebut her testimony. Are you sure your dad never told you what to say? Oh, no, 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 no. I think we're going to hear that. Interesting. So we're not done yet with this case. So that was all the testimony for yesterday, that in the hearing. Then this morning, the defense put on their final witness. And I'm going to go ahead and tell you about what happened this morning. This was Eric Bartolink. He is a forensic anthropologist and he works for the Human Identification Lab in California. And he specializes in identification of remains that have been burned. Oh, that gives me oh, a chill just went down my spine. Anyway, um, if you'll recall, the prosecution used a forensic, well, the FBI, the FBI used a forensic anthropologist to identify the bones and talk about trauma and burns of the bones. So he was given access, Mr. Bartolink. Actually, the, the de prosecution witness had said, yes, I know Mr. Bartolink, we wrote a textbook together. Uh, and I don't think we're saying anything different. So now we get to see what he's going to say. And um, he actually participated in burn identification or trauma identification to vic burn victims in the World Trade Center and some California wildfires. So he and two of his professors that also work for this human identification lab were given access to Tylee Ryan's remains, and they spent six and a half to seven hours examining her remains. And um, what they did was they, they put it, they put all the bones where they should be in skeletal format. And he said there was a large portion of the bones missing a large portion of her vertebral column, which is, you know, the column that goes down your back, uh, a large portion of her arms, her legs, um, ribs. So in an effort to explain these missing bones, he said, he wanted to talk about the size and length of a fire that you would need to do that. And he said, gasoline is not going to give you the combustion you need to burn a body, body in its entirety because it's it doesn't give you combustion for a long enough period of time. He said, it would, you need enough combustion that would take you more than two hours to burn a human body. So this does not, and we know that it was gasoline was identified to be the combustion at with, with respect to Tylee Ryan. So this doesn't explain what happened to the rest of her bones. They, the fire wasn't hot enough to burn those bones. So where are those bones? And he said they could be still on the property. Or they, he says, I had a large amount of fragments that I could not positively identify as being human or animal. And those could be part of the missing bones. Lovely testimony, right? <laughs> I did say that the body was burned intact. With perimorbid trauma. Yes. And with respect to defects, in fact, it, didn't you find that the, I believe the left mandible, um, I'm going to call it the jawbone if that's not correct. Let me know. That is correct. Okay. That the left mandible had been fractured. Is that correct? That is correct. I, I think in six different places. Um, I can't remember the number of places, but there, there were fractures to the, the left side of the mandible. And you did uh, determine that that had been from a blunt force trauma? Yes, although um, unable to tell if it's before or after death. So, you, so you, you can't make the paramotor versus postmortem distinction, but you still believe it was blunt force trauma? Um, correct. Likewise, I think you determined in your analysis that there was blunt force trauma on the skull, the sternum, and the ribs. Is that right? That is correct. And there were sharp form defects in the anominates or the hip bone. Is that right? That is correct. The sacrum. That is correct. And the cervical spine. 
Um, the ones on the cervical spine are possible sharp force defects, but uh, could not make a de uh, definitive determination on those. And with respect to the sharp uh, force defects, you did indicate that you can't exclude um, as some of the instruments that may have caused those to have been either a shovel or a pickaxe, correct? That cannot be excluded. I believe I provided a long list of possible implements. Yeah. And in fact, I think you you confirmed that uh, some of those traumas could have been from a chopping force. Is that right? That's correct. And you indicated a machete may have been used. Uh, that can't be excluded. And I think finally, you had indicated um, that there had been some rib fractures. Is that right? Uh, yes, I believe there were at least two rib fractures documented in the report. And you likewise believe that they, they were likely caused from blunt force trauma? Uh, yes, consistent with blunt force trauma. Uh, finally, I think in your report, you indicated that there were approximately a total of 18 sharp force defects in Tylee's bones, as well as a minimum of 16 impacts that were possible paramortem impacts on Tylee's bones. Is that correct? That is correct. Thank you, sir. Your Honor, I have no more questions. All right. So, I mean, bottom line, he's saying the same thing that the medical, the uh, foren FBI forensic anthropologist said. So that was the last defense witness. Then there was argument. Uh, well, first, the defense said, I, you know, they have no more witnesses. We've been told Chad Daybell will not be testifying. So they are prepared to rest their case. And the def and, but before they did that, the def the prosecution wanted to make an argument. They wanted to call Officer Cannon. Dr. Officer Cannon was the police officer that responded to the Chad Daybell residence after the attempted shooting of Tammy Daybell. There's been some discourse between, between what he is prepared to testify to and what Joe Murray, Emma's husband and Chad's son-in-law has said. Joe has said, first of all, there's been testimony that there was a Google search done and that this detective or this officer came in the house and looked at the Google search. And yes, that's a paintball gun. Now he says he never stepped foot in that house. Also in his report, he said that Joe Murray told him that morning or that evening he was out chopping wood for their fireplace and he heard a scream <laughs> he heard Tammy scream. Now, Joe says, no, I never heard Tammy scream. And no, I never told him that. Well, could, could he have misunderstood you? No, I was very clear. <laughs> so the prosecution wants to bring officer Cannon back to rebut this testimony. And the judge said he was prepared to let him come back except for the exclusionary rule. Unfortunately, when Officer Cannon was done testifying, he was released from his subpoena, which means he can now, he's now free to watch the trial. And he has been watching the trial. And the judge says, I'm very troubled by that. And uh, so he's not going to be allowing Officer Cannon to come back and testify. He says that the jury can rely on what they've already heard and decide who they believe. So I suspect this afternoon, Ray Hermosillo will be on the stand and maybe this witness against, um, that I talked about earlier, to testify about Tammy Dale's statement. And then I think that's it. Now, Monday, you know, I don't know if there's going to be, tomorrow they'll probably be doing jury instructions. You know, they'll be ar arguing a renewed motion for judgment of, of acquittal, probably from the defense, which always gets denied. And then they'll be, they'll have to go over jury instructions and then um, Monday's Memorial Day. So this may get to a jury by Tuesday or Wednesday of next week. Hallelujah. Because <laughs> I won't move on to another trial. Just, you know, guilty, let's go. But, but that won't, it won't be over because we still have the death penalty phase. Yes. So there's more. <laughs> I don't see this ending next week because during the death penalty phase, we get to hear victim impact statements. We also get to hear evidence of aggravating factors against 
Chad Daybell, and this is all assuming he gets convicted. Now, I don't know. You never know what a jury is going to do. But assuming he gets convicted, um, they will bring in these aggravating factors. Like, was there more than one victim? Was it this crime particularly heinous? Which it was. Um, but they're going to look at all those factors. And then they're going to look at mitigating factors. Like, what a wonderful guy this is. Like, look how good he does. He's an upstanding, you know, member of the LD church, LDS church. He was. He's not anymore. He's been excommunicated. I believe he's been excommunicated. You know, I'm not sure about that. Anyhow, but they're going to say, you know, he was a secretary of this, that, and the other in the LDS church, and he's an upstanding, and everybody respects him, and he, you know, whatever. So then the jury has to weigh, do the mitigating factors, does the good in Chad outweigh the bad? Okay. We shall see. <laughs> that is the show for today. I hope you enjoyed it. Take care, everybody, and I will see you tomorrow in Crafting and Crime Daily. Bye.